Okay, okay. Hi, welcome. Today we're gonna talk about community building and marketing for health and fitness brands. Very happy to have Alexa here, our guest speaker, to be with us and share her experience. Before we start, a few things. I'm your host, Alan Strong, and for the ones who don't know, I'm the founder of Incubate is a community for micro entrepreneurs, and I'm with my teammate Lauren here. So throughout the session, if you have any question, please do feel free to reach out to me and or Lauren. And typically, so this would would also be the same as our other events. For the first half of the hour, we will have the dialogue and interview with Alexa Colley, our guest, and she's going to share her personal story working for brands like Lululemon and the SoulCycle. And specifically for today, we hope to cover her role and her takeaways from her past experience working for those amazing uh, health and fitness brands. Also, as I know, Alexa also utilizing her past expertise and experience, she founded her own consulting firm. It's called um, Forever Friday. Wonderful name. <laughs> <laughs> and that she basically advised her clients in this industry, health and fitness industry. I know she also has her podcast, would love to get some, some takeaways from her current experience as well. And of course, um, always exciting to talk to her about looking into the future. What uh, are some of the predictions? There are also some of the new brands, new trains coming into this sector, this industry, all very exciting. So we'd love to touch upon on that if time allows as well. So the plan is to, for the first half of the hour, we're gonna obviously do a few questions between me and uh, Alexa, and then we'll open up the floor to our audience for Q and A. So for our audience, if you're in the clubhouse, if you have a question, raise your hand and uh, I will get you up on the stage to ask your question. For the ones who are from the Zoom, please type your question in the chat box. And uh, my teammate, Lori, is going to ask the question on your behalf, basically. With that, so without further ado, welcome again, Alexa. So happy to have you here. Thank you. Very excited to, yeah, to uh, hear from you about health and fitness um, marketing and communities for this sector. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and just a brief introduction before we dive into the questions. Alexa Colley started building communities for Lulu Lamont before it became a big brand. And she actually spent some of the best five years there. Later on, she moved on to join SoulCycle and was in charge of the regional marketing in the New York area. Currently, she ran her own marketing consulting service, um, as I mentioned. It's called Forever Friday, <laughs> with a focus in health and uh, fitness industry. Welcome again, Alexa. And I'd like to ask your, my first question is, can you bring us back to how you get into this um, industry first. I know your first job was with Lululemon, so bring us back in time and tell us what happened and how you got into Lululemon. What did you do there and what were the takeaways there? Yeah, yeah. that's a great question. And thank you so much for having me. I, uh, it's so funny. I got so lucky in the beginning of my journey. So I actually went to school down in Florida. I went to UCF for my undergraduate and I majored in English. I liked books. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I knew that I was from a town close to New York City. So I knew that everybody 
moved to the city. They got like an entry level job in marketing or advertising. And I thought that I would do that. So I graduated college. I moved home to Long Island and I needed a job to fill my days while I was searching for this big girl office job. And in that time, there was a new Lululemon opening in our local mall. And I walked in, I applied and I got the job on the spot. And it was a really great experience for me at the time. I really thought I was just taking on a job to help me fill my days while I was interviewing. I had no idea that I was going to find my best friends, a love for yoga, a love for working out. I had no idea really what I was walking into. And it happened quickly that I really fell in love with the company. It's, I don't know if you know much about Lululemon, but their, their business model is focused largely on personal development and understanding a lot about their employees and what makes them tick, what makes them happy. There's a really big emphasis on that. So it, it's a good place to spend your time. And I just, I fell in love with it. I met some of my best friends. I started yoga teacher training because it was such an emphasis there. And I worked my way up. I decided that I was going to stay there and not really pursue this like big girl job. And that was it. I worked my way up. I spent five years there. I eventually went on to open up some of the flagship locations. So the Flatiron flagship in on 17th and 5th in the Flatiron District in the city was one of my projects. And it was a really, it was a good time, like you said, to, to be at Lululemon. <laughs> that, that's awesome. And Alexa, you folk like your, your main role, especially maybe for a big part of that five years was to build the community. Was it? Yeah. Or, yes. Yeah, so that's a great question. So Lululemon, Lululemon is, in my is opinion, in my really opinion. one of the best and one of the first pioneers of true grassroots marketing. So Lululemon gives their employees, every single employee from you know the absolute lowest position to the highest position, everybody gets a stipend to spend on yoga classes, fitness classes, anything like that. And there were no stipulations. It was purely a benefit for you to use, but it was a really good way to encourage the sales associates and people who worked under the Lululemon ether to get out into the community. So many times people would have a shift at work when they would be off at four o'clock, they would know that there's a 4.30 class at Laughing Lotus Yoga right down the street. Everybody would be wearing the brand new Lululemon gear and would go to this yoga class. So everybody in this yoga class was seeing all the cool new yoga gear and they wanted to see, they wanted to try it on for themselves. So in terms of grassroots marketing, it was really a fantastic way to build community. Lululemon didn't spend a single dollar on advertising or marketing until I think 2018, I believe, when they had been in business for about, you know, 16, 17 years. So they really heavily relied on the community building aspect of building relationships with local studios. Oh, wow. That's amazing to know. It, so it, it wasn't Lulu Lamont's exclusive class because I knew sometimes they, they have class in, in their stores even, mm -hmm. but they basically gave, they gave stipend for employee or, or even customers to go to the studio. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate calling Yeah, that. so it was actually, it was both. So both things that you mentioned. So it was the stipend yeah, and then it was also every Sunday we what would host classes any, yeah. It would be yoga classes, hit classes, anything My like that. We would host instructors in the community inside the stores. So again, you know how I was talking about, you have people going to a yoga studio who just bought all mm. the new lemon gear. Was that you were bringing sales associates into the community. The and the other portion of that where we would host the Sunday yoga classes was that you were bringing the community into the store to see the new gear. So you were really, you were getting a lot of eyeballs onto the product, but really doing so by just immersing yourself into the lifestyles of your clientele. You were really just meeting them where they were. Gotcha. Got it. And I, 
I heard you repetitively saying you just love it, and there's some aspect of that, the community building part, the grassroots marketing part that kept you there for five years was quite long, right? Mm-hmm. So what are the other things that you love, you just love about Lululemon that that kept you there for that long? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it. I think it was one of the first times that I had seen a company really focused on my growth. And I really, I feel like I got just so lucky. And I know it was specifically, it was a very good time that I was there from 2013 to 2018. And I, it, to me, the way that Lululemon prioritizes someone's growth and personal development is unparalleled. I've, I still haven't still seen, haven't that, seen that, that in many other companies. I, you know, hear from my friends and my family, how things are going for them at work. And it's different. Lululemon was really focused on you as a whole person. It wasn't just focused, the organization really wasn't just focused on who you were inside the four walls. Like many places are like, you walk out the door and they don't really care what you do afterwards. It just, it wasn't like that. It was because there were like-minded people working for the organization, people who prioritized health and prioritized wellness, you would want to do the same things with them. So you guys would leave the store, you would go to the same yoga class, you would go to the same coffee shop, you would, it was really, it was like this whole ecosystem that was built into one company and it made it really easy to stay there. It was, it was really a great place to work. Gotcha. Wow. That's um, fascinating. But still at certain point after five years, you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, tell us about what made you to to make the decision to to move on and mm-hmm. I know after that you joined so cycle tell mm-hmm. us about the story there yeah so it's, it's so interesting right like the boutique fitness industry and this whole just everything that's happened in the fitness industry just the growth was very quick, right? From even just when I started from 2013 until now we're at 2021, like it's just been an incredible amount of growth and things have changed very drastically. So when I started it, I had no idea this was even something I was really interested in. And all of a sudden I learned a lot about myself and I, it was that coupled with, I fell in love with SoulCycle. It was evolving right around the same time as Lululemon. It was buzzy. There weren't that many other boutique fitness studios. They were really the first ones doing what they were doing and for the price point they were doing it for. So it was really this interesting, like Lululemon was the first of luxury athleisure. SoulCycle was the first of luxury spinning, like luxury workouts. So it was really interesting to me and I feel very lucky that I got to work with both pioneers. I just think that is something I'm just thankful for every single day. And anyway, yeah, I fell in love with the SoulCycle product. I was recruited for this position to work in headquarters. I oversaw 26 studios, all New York, Hamptons, New Jersey, Long Island, and I oversaw the marketing for all those studios. So it was kind of a a seamless transition to me. There was a lot of overlap within the companies. I still knew a lot of people. Um, I felt like I was still in the same world. I didn't really feel like I was leaving anything behind, so to speak. So there was that. I do have to mention Lululemon headquarters are in Vancouver. So I really, if I was going to keep growing and keep going up, I was going to need to move to Vancouver and I love it there very much but my home is New York so I needed to stay in New York that, that makes total sense congratulations that was a good move seems like it's a bigger role right you were in charge of marketing for 26 boutique studios in the New York area so mm-hmm. what did you do there how I, I imagine you you definitely made some impact in the growth for SoCycle there. What did you do there? What have you achieved? What are the takeaways from 
Yeah. So I got really lucky there. I was hired because they were doing a restructuring of the marketing department and the soul cycle had grown very quickly. And I think they had to scale back at a certain point and they were like, okay, are we going to do this growth authentically or are we just going to grow? And so they were looking for people to help advise if the growth should happen on a more grassroots level or if it should happen on a digital level like they were really just looking for advisors on how how everything should play out and so i had i inherited a team of five field marketing managers and i i was given the opportunity to sort of mold their roles into what i thought would be beneficial for the community so i had them focused on local partnerships. So I had one field marketing manager that was responsible for if we wanted to put some bikes in a Bloomingdale's on a Saturday morning, she would be the one to go and do that and sign people up for classes. I had one field marketing manager that was responsible for teaching studios, hospitality, best practices, you know, exactly how to word that email. That's a follow-up to someone. I had someone focused on corporate partnerships. So she would book in all the Goldman Sachs guys on their 5 a.m. ride. <laughs> uh, I had one person that was focused directly on the Hamptons because it's a different clientele there and they need a little bit more support. And then I'm blanking on what the last one was, but basically, yeah, it was there to help restructure the restructure what the marketing really looked like at the local and holistic level. Gotcha. Seems like your focus was more partnership and, and business development there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I, yeah. I wonder, you mentioned the terms luxury boutique fitness studio and luxury athletic leisure. In your, in your eyes, what is the, the difference, I would say, what is the difference between quote-unquote luxury and, and just a normal membership, for example, mm -hmm. and also what is the difference between like a fitness studio, like a teaching a class, having a class, and all the other accessories could mm -hmm. be at leisure, like clothing, could be some other accessories that are associated mm -hmm. with. Yeah, I think the question of what does luxury mean in the fitness landscape is super important because prior to Equinox, it wasn't a thing. Equinox invented this, your eucalyptus scented towels and the Kiehl's products around, like that wasn't really a thing. And then SoulCycle just took it to a whole nother level. And I think okay. the luxury aspect of it you would be remiss not to mention the hospitality that comes into play when you're demanding such a high price point. So I think to me, really when I think of luxury and this applies to boutique studios, but it also applies to hotel chains, it applies to restaurants. Like when you're paying a high price for something, you really expect to have absolutely phenomenal service. And SoulCycle was one of the first ones. They were charging $34 a class right out the gate. That was what they charged when they first started. And to charge that every single time someone comes back, no memberships, no discounts, nothing requires a level of care for your clients that you just can't drop the ball. And so for me, luxury would mean being taken care of. If I didn't like a class, I could send an email and say, hey, FYI, that instructor was not up to par with SoulCycle. And someone would answer me immediately and say, I completely understand. Here's your class back. Like that hospitality. And I, I chatted with one of my friends, Gabby Cohen is, she was the fifth employee at SoulCycle. She built the brand and she's, I have my episode airing with her in a few weeks. And she was like, it was just the most important thing to always be there for the guest. And to me, I think that is, in the boutique fitness arena, that is just what luxury means. That's great. That makes me think of, you know, luxury hotel, mm -hmm. which is like you said, like making people feel taken care of no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. This is the concept of luxury hospitality. Yeah.
Yeah, definitely. That's awesome. All right. Okay. So let's move on um, along your career path. I know somewhere just in the past year or so, you basically started, you basically took the expertise you have gained over the uh, past few years and, and you started your own consulting company helping folks to launch and build their own I suppose boutique health and fitness brand mm-hmm. right so tell us about again what made you do that move and how is it different working now on your own advising clients to build their own brands versus mm-hmm. working in a, in a big brand yeah, I think for me, it was really a seamless transition. I've always known that I wanted to have something of my own. I have always known that I wanted to have my own organization. And Lululemon places such a strong emphasis on entrepreneurship and just being a leader for the world, like not just being a leader for the organization, but just being a, a good leader. And so I really learned the foundation of that there. And as time went on working for Lululemon and for SoulCycle in New York, I just... I met so many people that were part of the larger organization or a larger organization, but really desperately did want to have something of their own. And it really happened very organically. I would just get questions from people saying, if I want to leave Equinox or if I want to leave a gym, what do you like, what do you suggest I do to retain clients? So I would help them advise on that. I would help people advise on how do you open a studio without a large amount of investment capital? Like SoulCycle, and this is public knowledge, but SoulCycle would only have been able to expand the way it did because they took the money from Equinox in the beginning. And not everyone has that opportunity. So I, I started helping people figure out a launch strategy for studios or even a digital platform. And it, it really just evolved again, like just very organically. And I love, love, love the startup phase of companies. I, and I know you do too. I just, I really, there's something to me. Yeah. There's something to me that just really watching somebody, especially in the fitness space and the wellness space, people get into this industry because they really want to help people. They want to help people look their best, live their best, eat their best. And it's exciting to me to be able to work with so many people that have such great intentions and to help them build their product. So I'm incredibly lucky to be doing what I'm doing. And yeah, it it literally, I just got a notification from LegalZoom that my LLC was filed one year ago. So it was just about a full year ago now. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. I, especially I would say since the pandemic for the past year or so, I myself, I have witnessed there's this surge of a lot of the like yoga teacher or health fitness trainer, uh, Mm -hmm. personal trainer, instructor, they strike out on their own. And also Mm -hmm. there's a surge or acceleration of all kinds of tools to help those individuals um, do remote classes, having opened their own virtual studio. So mm-hmm. I'm curious, what's your take on this whole trend shifting? And in, also in terms of the future, the future of fitness and um, health and fitness, what could be emerging mm-hmm. from this? Yeah, look, it's, it is a saturated market. We can't we, you just can't deny that there are a lot of instructors out there, but there always have been. And the funny thing to me about the pandemic is that it feels like there are more instructors now, but I think it's just that there are more instructors that finally feel confident enough to do something about it online. Like before the pandemic, we still had like New York has thousands and thousands of yoga graduates every single month. There's tons and tons of people who are certified instructors, but pre-pandemic, I think people were just going to their nine to five jobs. Maybe they had a few clients on the side and they would talk about it. But now that everybody has the time and that they're seeing other people talk about their business and really put themselves out there, I think people feel empowered to do that. So I think it feels like we're seeing a higher volume of instructors, but I don't actually know if we are. Does that answer that question? 
That's very insightful. That's <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Amazing. And then, so, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, remind me of the second part of the question. I had it and I lost it. Oh, yeah, I guess the, the second part is, it seems like there are also more tools, like digital tools to help those people mm -hmm. launch you know, their own business. What's your, what's, what's your take on that? Yeah. Gonna, gonna make any impact since maybe it's just a different way of teaching. Yes. That's an interesting question. And I'm, I'm very curious to see what happens with all of these software companies popping up. There's a lot. I had Alexandra Bonetti on my podcast recently. She started Talent Hack and they were really the originators of creating a software to support instructors. So there's that. I just heard of one of my clients is using something called On Podio. That's another, just like another software hosting that kind of handles a lot of the back end tech stuff for instructors. So there will be a lot of companies that are coming out. I think for me, and I don't like to rush things. I'm not that kind of person, but it does feel like just speed is going to be the name of the game. Whoever can, mm -hmm. you know, figure this out perfectly first is going to be the winner. But there will be an interesting, I think, evolution of what happens with these companies and where they really go. Because I'm not an instructor, but I don't, I know there's a, nece a slight necessity for it, but I don't know, I don't know how much money exactly that would be worth to me monthly to send around a Zoom link and... I'm not really sure what else goes into it, but that. Gotcha. Gotcha. I, I know like now you mentioned your podcast. I know you, mm -hmm. you interview some other experts in this industry through your podcast and you interact with your clients who wants to build their own boutique brands. So mm -hmm. with, with all those movements going on, what's your, if you are to, try to paint a picture of the future of of fitness and health what could be for example what could be the the future new norm uh, or mm -hmm. what could be a brand a new brand looking like mm -hmm. I really think that I think the boutique studio is not dead I think the one thing that we do have to consider is that people have invested a lot of money in their at-home equipment over the past few months. People have Pelotons, treadmills, weights, micro reformers. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of people who have spent thousands of dollars on their at-home equipment and they have been forced to find instructors that they like. They've been forced to find classes that they like and People have settled into that. And I think that it's feeling pretty good and it's feeling doable and you're not losing the hour a day that you were using to commute to another studio. So in terms of people figuring out their at-home routine, I think people have really got that down pat. I do think, and something that I'm seeing with some of my other clients who are in other locations. Now I'm in New York, we can't open yet for boutique fitness. You can only open for open gym, but I have some clients in Boston that are open. I have clients in North Carolina that are open right now. And they're seeing a huge surge in people coming in. But what they're seeing is more people coming less frequently. So I think the frequent class goer, the person who was going five to six times a week, I think that is going to be a little bit, I think that's going to go out the window a little bit. I think we're going to have a higher concentration of clients coming in less often because no matter what people just, people still need to get out of their house. There's just, there's something about the group fitness environment that is just so special. So I do think like, really, I just think we're going to have a higher concentration of people coming less often. Gotcha. So it, it's like, yeah, there might be a surge because we've been constrained at home for so long. Like it's almost like a rebound, re rebounding back, mm -hmm. but, but our time might be more fragmented. So mm -hmm. we don't come as often. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, well, definitely. Uh, we have one person, Kesley, raised the hand. So Kesley, I'm pressing the button to see if you <laughs> could come up to speak. <laughs> Kesley? Kelsey? 
Uh, she cannot join right now. Okay. Oh. Later. Okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> anyway, um, if you do have a question, feel free to raise your hand and um, uh, I can basically invite you up on the stage to ask the question. All right, hold a second. I think, let me try again. <laughs> Kelsey. Kelsey, can you speak now? All right. Um, technical. <laughs> yeah. <let's, laughs> yeah. All right. Anyway, that's fascinating. And uh, tell us a little bit more about, I, I would say, the podcast you're doing or somehow, somehow technical. I could not get Kelsey to come up to ask the question. Sorry. Yeah, no. So I started, I just, it's so funny. I, I started the podcast only about six weeks ago. And I, like I said, I just, I've been really lucky enough to meet some pretty awesome industry leaders. And I would have these meetings that I just knew we were having valuable conversations that people who were just getting started in the industry really would benefit from hearing. So I started the podcast as a sort of how I built this podcast, but strictly focused on the health and wellness industry. So I really, I just talked to people who built some really amazing health and wellness focused brands, asked them how they did it. If they could do it all over again, what would they change? What advice they have for instructors and people who are just getting started. And it has been an absolute blast. I am absolutely loving it. It's called the Friday Society. It's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen. And yeah, it's been so much fun. Gotcha. Okay. It, it, that's awesome. I, I hope folks can check it out. Talk about, I think you mentioned Peloton. Is that the right way to pronounce that? <laughs> Peloton, yeah. So you mentioned that it, it seems to, that seems to be a new type of model or brand emerging in the health fitness industry which fit right into the post-COVID world, you know, where you mm -hmm. stay more time, spend more time at home, and it's hardware plus software plus the real world trainer. So any, any opinion or take on that? Since there's the Lululemon model, there's SoulCycle model, we talk about the luxury part aspect of a business model. What's your take on the Peloton model. Mm -hmm. So the Peloton business model is actually very interesting. So they started, I think they opened their studio in Chelsea in 2014. It was when we were shifting our Lula Union Square store into the Lululemon Flatiron flagship. And they opened as a studio, but their vision was always an at-home bike. So they had the at-home bike that was available for purchase in syndication with the studio. So the classes would be filmed in the studio. So when you were at home, it really felt like you were taking a, a class in a studio with other people. And my mom got one a very long time ago. And so she's had it for a while. And the way that they've evolved is really amazing. They have dealt with a lot of shipping issues, logistical issues. They've dealt with a lot and they, and it's, we just talked about a talent hack. It's just, if you can just be one of the first ones, just start. Like talent hack just needed to start. Peloton just needed to start. And they happened to be the right place at the right time, which was an already established brand going into a world where their product was really necessary. I think their business model is incredibly interesting and they're absolutely, they're going to thrive. And it, it's not just because of their product, but it's SoulCycle has an at-home bike now. And we would be remiss not to mention that SoulCycle has not handled many issues very well recently, whereas Peloton has. Like the Peloton 
way that they've handled Black Lives Matter and the way that they've handled a lot of issues that have come up over the last few months has been really admirable. They allowed their instructors to feel what they were feeling and talk about it and go public and say, this is screwed up. This is what we're going through right now. And it was really, it felt really nice to see that's how they were handling it. And there are other companies that were scared to say something or scared to be political. And I think in this day and age and 2020, what we went through in 2021, it, you just can't be afraid as a brand anymore to say, Hey, this is what I'm seeing. This is not okay. And this is what I stand for. So Peloton has done that. They've done a really good job doing that. And therefore have really instilled themselves as a brand to trust for who their, their clientele is. Gotcha. And, and as a individual fitness, fitness trainer, or let's say yoga teacher, right? What's your advice to them? Should, should they join one of those bigger or emerging brands? Or should they open their own boutique ones or take private or open a, as a private business? What would be your advice to, to clients? Yeah, I think if you're considering starting your own endeavor, I would say go for it, but just make sure that you're going to do it right. Because you're going to start with a few clients. You're not going to start with very many, but the people that you are going to start with are going to change your entire career. They're the ones that if you play your cards, they're going to be with you for the rest of your journey of being a trainer or being a coach or anything like that. But you have to be focused on bringing people value. Like it's just absolutely necessary. So it is really, we're talking a lot about hospitality today. You have to go into it knowing that you are going to be this person's cheerleader. You're going to be their best friend in their health and wellness journey. So I would say really just learn how to do things the right way and how to set up the right foundations, which is something that I teach. So that's something that is incredibly important. And I think you can make it on your own hundred percent. I don't think, especially in this day and age, I don't think you need the larger support of a name or a brand. I think you can be your individual person, your individual product, but you need to have the right foundation. The right foundation is to create or add value to the clients. Just to be there for them and to have everything set up. Is your, do you have your retention plan set up for your clients? Do you know how you're going to get them to come back the second, third, fourth time? Do you know how you're going to get all your first timers to convert into lifetime clients? Like these are the things that I would say, just take some time and really learn these things first and then put it into practice and, and you'll fly. But if you have a hundred people coming into a class and you have no plan for how to get them into their second class you're not going to get them back. Like you need to have a retention plan. You need to have these things built in so that when you get these hundred people in, you can estimate you're going to get a 50% conversion and that's great. And so then the next week you have 50 returning and you have a hundred new, and then that's how you build things, but you really do need to set up the proper foundations. Gotcha. Got it. That, that makes total sense. But um, a, a, the, the signal or the message I, I got is you do believe in the, let's say, next decade, there could be more and more of those boutique brands where people probably associate more with an individual trainer or individual mm-hmm. coach. You know, for me, like, I, I, I trust my, I trust this Jen, this, my yoga teacher. I'd rather just follow her anywhere mm-hmm. she goes. Yeah. What's, that yeah absolutely and I hope we just have more and more boutique studios that are able to open up because we've had a lot that have had to close and it's been incredibly sad but I think to me like a local yoga studio a local your local boutique fitness studio is it's like your local restaurant it's like your local coffee shop it just makes your community feel whole it's a local business owner you're supporting someone who's in your community I just think I think I absolutely, I hope that we are able to see more of that pop up. 
Gotcha. That's awesome. I'm gonna. I've been holding the mic for so long <laughs> to the audience. If you have a question, raise your hand. If otherwise, if you don't mind, um, I'm gonna just basically unmute all of you and feel free to introduce yourself or ask a question if you like. If you're okay with that. Yeah, say hi. Hi, exactly. Shing, I actually just unmuted you. You want to say hi? Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> How are you? I really enjoyed the information that you shared, your journey with Lululemon. Thank you. Very um, enlightening in terms of community <laughs> building. Building a beauty and wellness brand now, and we're launching this year. So we're just trying to get insights onto how to build, start, and like grow a strong foundation. Mm -hmm. And um, I really like that personal development aspect. I think that was in Lululemon. Mm -hmm. I think that may be something we might implement as well. So yeah. Just... Oh, absolutely. Are you planning to be a brick and mortar studio or are you going to be digital? So it's not going to be a studio. It's a um, beauty. It's like a body butters and Got it. yeah. Okay. Amazing. Yes. Yeah, so you're going to be selling on commerce awesome. and then, you know, at some point retail. Amazing. Oh, congratulations. That's so exciting. Thank you. Yeah. It's really a journey and uh, honestly, I'm enjoying the process. Yeah. Learning from my community. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I would say if I could give you any advice, I would say your first few purchasers keep their information somewhere. It In five years from now, you're going to look back and say, I wonder who they were and I wish I could do something for them. Always keep the information of your first few clients because it's so special when you can celebrate them and say, hey, thanks for thanks for making a difference when we needed it in the beginning. And yeah. you'll, find, you'll a find a way to celebrate, way to celebrate them. So that would be my main little tidbit. Oh, that's great. Yeah, um, we definitely will. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Well, thank you, Shin. Lily, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Hi. Um, great to hear about your experiences. So oh, thank you. I followed this space as a customer and as an enthusiast and mm. actually as a founder as well. I used to, uh, I co-founded a cold fresh juice company back in the day, but it, it was just interesting to hear because everything you're talking about I, I think happened later in mm. outside of the U.S., but mm -hmm. maybe faster. Yep. In certain ways, like a kind of maybe a more rapid adoption. Yeah. Yeah. I just I really appreciated hearing everything you're talking about, and I think getting to that special sauce of like brand integrity is so important, and so few brands do it super mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Totally. And I think you're making such a good point. Do you remember Organic Avenue when that was open? <laughs> like that, it's so, your point of it happened quickly is so accurate because it's funny. I look back and I'm like, if Organic Avenue was around now, how successful would they have been? They, I, their product was just introduced, I think a little bit too early. Like it was just, we just weren't ready for it. And it's very interesting, like the timeline of when certain companies popped up, but it definitely made the client, the success or took it down. So super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a place, I'm sorry, I joined a little late, so I may have missed this, but is there a place we can follow of what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me here <laughs> or at my Instagram for my business is foreverfriday.co. So just foreverfriday.co. 
and I share a lot of small business resources for health and wellness brands specifically. So a lot of like user journey things, client retention worksheets, like I have all that there. And yeah, that's probably the best space. And then I have my podcast, which is a lot of something very similar to this where I bring on other health and wellness leaders. And that is the Friday Society podcast. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. I know I didn't even say that yet. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. I actually have a follow up mm-hmm. on that, Alexa. So in your experience, how or what are some of the best practices for a studio or a brand to work with partners? Partners like Coke Press Juice or or some or even mm-hmm. clothing. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. And it's so true. Like when we were talking about juices, right? Every, a lot of my job when I was at Lululemon was to make sure that every store was set up for their Sunday morning yoga class, that they were approaching instructors that they wanted to bring in and give some light to, that they were approaching the local coffee shop to come in and sample some coffee. So definitely local partnerships are huge, amazingly beneficial. And again, like just, you want to keep it local. You want to every, you want to know the human being who's behind what you're buying. And I think something like advice that I can give is no matter if you are a juice company or a studio or whatever you are, consider who your target consumer is. And this is like the workshop that I do. I have a marketing coaching group. And this is like the very first thing that we talk about is in your ideal world, who's the client that's coming in and out of your store? How much money do they have to spend? What do they like to spend their money on? How do they like to spend their time? Do they like to spend their time in the bath or at the park or getting a glass of wine with friends? Like you really just want to consider exactly who your demographic is. And then you want to consider what their life looks like on a day-to-day basis. So you want to figure out if it's, if it was the soul cycle target demographic, if they were coming to see us at 9 30 on a Sunday, they were probably going to shower and then go out to brunch with their friends. So how could we partner up with the, per- the restaurant that we knew they were going to go to brunch to, right? And figure out a way to integrate our products. So I think my ultimate advice for how to approach local partnerships is envision the lifestyle of your consumer and find a way to work your lifestyle in. So I think I might be saying this wrong if it's Jen. I'm so sorry if I mispronounced it, but I think for body butter, right? That's something you want to consider. Okay, cool. So we know someone's putting body butter on after they are in the shower or after they take a bath. Maybe think about what their day looks like before they take this bath. Are they, is there a wine brand or a local a local wine shop that you could maybe partner with to sell, sell your body butter in there. Have this like self-care kit, right? That would just be so fun. And that's something that if that is the target consumer, you've found a way to get some different eyes on your product in a way that you maybe hadn't considered before. That's amazing. Thank you. Stephanie. Right. (laughs) It's great. Great tip. Stephanie, go ahead. Hey. Hi, I'm Stephanie. Hi. (laughs) Hi. Thank you, Alexa, and thank you, Alice, for making this talk happen. It was really awesome to be a part of, and I learned a lot of great tips. I actually work in product development at Harry's, which is not really related to this topic, but I personally love visiting studios, Mm -hmm. and it was one of my favorite things to do in New York pre-COVID. It was interesting to hear from your perspective on how studios are shifting strategies and how they're starting to see a different type of customer. I guess my question then for you there is, as they start to increase their target market, um, how does that affect marketing and how do these studios stand out from one another when there's um, so many small boutique studios. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's going to be, there's definitely going to be growing pains because we have to consider some of the biggest names at SoulCycle and some of these instructors that have really like a celebrity status 
we're used to seeing people come in three to four times a week. They were used to seeing this very high frequency. And I do think that the frequency level is just going to change. And so I think I, I am hopeful for it though, because I do think, I don't know if, if studios are going to need to expand their target market. I just think we're going to start to see more of those less frequent people, maybe the people that used to show up once a month or something like that. I think we'll see them a little bit more because they need to get out of their houses. And I just think that we'll see the more frequent people come a little bit less, but I am, I'm very hopeful about it because I think something that I like to tell my clients too, is that to think that SLT, right. Or like the local Pilates studio was competing with the soul cycles just wasn't an accurate portrayal of what was really going on. People were the person who goes to the boutique fitness class. And I'm sure like you, Stephanie, I'm sure you probably liked to sample a lot of the different boutique studios in your area. You weren't just going to just one. And so I think, so I'm really excited for, I think, I hope that a lot of studios are going to start to band together and see that, okay, no, we have this group of a hundred thousand people and they'll come to me once and they'll go to you once. And it'll be great because they'll be getting the diversity and they'll be getting these different product offerings and their bodies will be healthy. And I'm hopeful that studios can just start to look at it as a shared demographic, as opposed to just trying to hold on very tightly to any one client. Yeah, that was super helpful. Thank you. Yeah, of course. That's awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. All right, Kelsey. <laughs> Sorry, talk now. Before. Hi, Kelsey. <laughs> I think I pressed the wrong button and then couldn't look at the phone to fix it. Oh, we're happy um, to have you. Uh, really enjoyed this talk so far. Thank I you. I hoping you could talk about your thought process when you were joining these brands. If you could mm. tell, like, there were certain signs that these would be rocket ship brands that would take off. Mm -hmm. um, and then, second, part of the question like if there are any things you you tried when you were working on building these communities that didn't work and you had to walk it back and reevaluate mm -hmm. that's those are such good questions yeah for the first question uh, I think I honestly I just think like the way that the brands made me feel was so incredibly important to me and Lululemon specifically it just has a good feeling about the stores. And I like to say this a lot, and I don't know if it's just because I had such a great experience there or whatever, but no matter where I am, I worked for Lululemon in the New York tri-state area. And I, I did a few stints in some of the Santa Barbara stores, like just helping them do things. But mainly I was just in New York. And no matter what, every single time I go to any other Lululemon, it's the exact same experience. It's consistent, it's happy, it's people are smiling and it feels like home. It just feels very welcoming and like you're not really judged there. And I just, I loved that vibe and I loved the energy. And I think that was a really easy yes for me. And it was very similar with Soul Cycle. Like it was, I just always felt good when I was going to the classes and I felt like, I really liked the product and I mostly just loved the energy coming out of people. I loved the people were smiling and happy. And to me, happy employees just always signifies and just like the way someone smiles at you when you walk in. And this could be anywhere. If you're interviewing for jobs or if you're, you know, about to have an interview with a reporter or anything like that, like the way someone smiles at you and the way that they talk to you in the first few minutes gives you a very good indication of what your relationship will be like. Like you just, I think, need to trust yourself enough to trust your gut when it comes to meeting someone. And that really should just steer if you feel like the company will be the right fit for you. So I think that's probably my answer. It's just that the energy just felt really fantastic when I was there. And remind me of your second question one more time. Yeah, totally. So I'll just add, I recently discovered the Lululemon subreddit. And I think I've made three times as many purchases as I have. So <laughs> I understand the, the energy piece. That's a good one. <laughs> and then for my second question, 
I was just curious if there were any times where maybe like an initiative or mm -hmm. some sort of building activity didn't work and you had to reevaluate. Yeah, God, who doesn't have that? I think, honestly, this is so funny. I'm like, I feel like such a Lululemon evangelist right now, but they did a really good job at recognizing that they had a lot of people who were entry level. They had a lot of people that were not, they weren't, we weren't C-suite executive level, professionally trained, like white guys in suits. Like it was a lot of people who just graduated college and people who had side hustles. And it was really a, a place where they understood that they weren't, that they were going to be training some like a degree of professionalism. And I think the way that they used to frame recapping initiatives that you would take part in was really helpful where it would be like after every single thing you did every sale you ran every window display every newsletter email like everything you did you would go back and say okay what are the wins and what are the opportunities and if framing I think failures in terms of what the opportunities were was incredibly helpful for me just in teaching me that everything nothing is going to be a hundred percent perfect, but if you can identify the one to 5% of something that didn't work and you can just try to fix it a little bit, just a little bit the next time you'll be really successful. And so I think that is just something that I always try to do is like, okay, what about this went well? And what about this could be better next time? Awesome. Yeah. That's it's so easy to overlook when you're done with a project mm -hmm. and move on to the next one, but yeah really helpful yeah and I think a lot of people were in such a go-go -go environment and a lot of people don't take the time, to, time reflect. to reflect like, like and, it, and it's, it's, hard, it's hard and sometimes you just feel like all right well that's right, done moving done, on and on. the reflection part of it just goes missing and I think it's just it's so critical to keep doing that even if it's just for yourself even if you put in your calendar put it the day after you run a campaign or something like just put five minutes to say okay I'm going to look back at what happened and I'm going to figure out where it could have gone better. Thank you. Yeah. I think especially now in COVID it's, it's like given us more time. So mm -hmm. you know, this is the perfect time to start doing something like that. Yeah, totally. Thank you, Kelsey and uh, uh, Alexa, you're such, now you're making me wanting to work for Lula. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think I do that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing. I also, I would love to echo your point is the great company is making, just making it like a learning experience, like mm -hmm. making a good experience for, for your employee or customer. That's all it matters, I mm -hmm. guess. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, a amazing talk. So many pearls of good advice I would say thank you so much we are um, on the time thanks everyone who joined me and mm. for um, asking questions I, every time I feel like we always have great great questions Amazing. great speakers thank you guys yeah say hi to me on Instagram I love I your questions were amazing I would love to connect you guys and see what you're all up to yeah please do that and uh, we'll talk Hopefully, we'll see you next time. Amazing. Bye. 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 Bye.